Well, good morning, good afternoon, I should say. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It's lovely to be with you all. Um, please do keep your Bibles open to John chapter 1. We'll be looking at that this, uh, this afternoon. Um, I want to start with a question. Who is the most famous person you've ever met? That's fine. Well, the, the most famous person that I've met um, would probably have to be the comedian Miranda Hart. I say met, I spotted her at a distance at a festival. Um, but to be honest, I don't have anyone more famous than a few physicists and mathematicians who you won't have heard of, so this will have to do. Um, but why do we value meeting famous people? Why do we find meeting famous people to be an event of note? They are just people after all. I would argue that the reason is that it connects us to something bigger and more public than our daily lives. Something that we think, uh, think of as more significant. Maybe that's why you're here. To see what all the fuss is about with this God stuff. And it is Christmas after all. Well, John's first readers were in the Roman Empire at the end of the first century. Before there were many who could become celebrities. There was no internet, no phones, TV. All you had were decrees. And basically the only celebrity of any sort was the emperor himself. And he decreed to everyone that they were free to worship whoever they like, as long as they also worship the emperor as a god, or else. John himself was exiled late in life because of how much he was talking about this random Galilean preacher called Jesus of Nazareth something or other. It all seemed a bit pointless. These readers may well have been yearning to be part of something bigger, and coming to this book to see what the fuss is about. And John informs them that God is here. So prepare to meet him. God is here. So prepare to meet him. So as we take a look at this passage, I must ask you, are you prepared, are we prepared, to meet him? Because God is real. God is real. Let's look at verses 1 to 5 together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It's pretty obvious from the start what John is trying to say here, isn't it? In the beginning was the Word. Sound familiar? In the beginning, God. He's clearly invoking Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 in this passage. John is saying that that same God who created the world all those years ago, not only is the Word himself, but also with the Word, if you can understand that. But that contains life which is the light of all mankind. And the darkness has not overcome it. We see a real statement of who God is and how powerful he is in this passage. How powerful he has always been and how powerful he remains to be and will remain to be. If you don't think that he's real, then let me inform you that he is. It's good news that he is indeed real. All this seemingly meaning, meaningless suffering in the world isn't meaningless. God gives it meaning. He's using it for something good. But this is the, beside the point that John is trying to make. Okay, God is real. So what? Why does that matter to me? Because he created you. Verse 3, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. You were created by him to be in relationship with him and to enjoy his presence in eternal bliss. That is the purpose that you were created for, that I was created for. But it doesn't feel like that, does it? Well, that's because we have sinned. We have broken God's law and we have been separated from him because of it. We can't currently have a relationship with him in our present state because God detests sin. 
we have offended the most powerful being in existence, in existence, and the most patient being in existence. Imagine offending someone that patient. It's not good. You can think of God's law like a law of physics. They are universal because he made both. They apply as much here as they do on the other side of the universe. The only difference is that we can break these. So why shouldn't we expect consequences when we do? And turning our way back? This makes no sense when you think about it. No reasonable law in, in the human world works this way. If someone is a murderer, they've killed someone, then they're a murderer. It doesn't matter if, they, doesn't matter if they give money to charity, or are generous, or kind to their friends. They're a murderer. That's not how it works. We're trapped. In darkness, with no way to escape. I think that you'll agree, it's some predicament to be in. But we have some good news. In fact, we have great news. Because God is sending a light into that, into that darkness. God is sending a light. Look down with me at verses 6 to 13. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. We've already looked at how dire our situation is. But God does not leave us alone. God promises to send a light. And that light is mentioned before in the passage of John. But it also appeared in the first passage that was read to us today. Did you notice in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. A light which Isaiah talked about some 800 years before John did. Something happened between Isaiah and John that was significant. So significant that John starts talking about this light, which hadn't been mentioned in, uh, in previous Gospels. <coughs> he starts talking about it in the past tense. God's bright light has come into the world. God's light has started to shine in the darkness. The darkness of our lives. The things that we've done wrong, the laws that we've broken, the offence that we've caused God. God loved us enough to send a light into the darkness. He had a rescue plan and he enacted it. Why? Because he wanted to. He knows who, you, who we are. He knows that we lie and cheat and hate and hurt. And he cared. People will say that he didn't care, but he cared. He cared enough to see past those things and declare that we are worth all of this effort. You are worth all this effort. How much effort? The most effort that you can think of. Because the light is God himself. God is that light. Take a look at verses 14 to 18 with me. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have received all we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. 
No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. There, did you see it? Right in verse 14. The Word became flesh, and dwelt, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. We've heard so much about this light, this rescue plan of God in the first in the first 13 verses of the passage. But what or who is this light? It's this thing we've talked about called the Word, who we have already established is really God himself. God himself is the light. More specifically, the Son of God comes to earth as Jesus Christ. God himself contained in human form. How amazing is that? Verse 18, no one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. But how did he make God known? Dazzling lights, fireworks, whiz, bang, look at me! This is my triumphant entry into, into my own creation. <coughs> no, no. He was born as the son of a seemingly random couple in Nazareth, a northern town in Israel. He was raised by his earthly father to be a carpenter as he was. When he was 30, he began public ministry as a nomad, a travelling preacher who lived off of donations from his listeners but never demanded them to contribute. After three years, the rulers finally got sick of him and sentenced him to death on a cross. Possibly the most horrific punishment ever devised by humanity. And as he bled there, that little baby that we think of in the crib, he thought of you and me. And he took the punishment that we deserve. And he did that because he loved you and me. In fact, while he is being murdered, the only comment he has on his killers is simply, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. But the Christmas story doesn't stop at death. What started with the birth of life in a manger concludes with the triumph of life emerging from an empty tomb. Jesus is alive. The miracle of miracles has occurred. Death has been defeated. Sin has been defeated. And we can have that relationship that we were meant to have. As C.S. Lewis puts it in his book, Mere Christianity, the Son of God became man to enable men to become sons of God. The Son of God became man to enable men to become sons of God. This is a gift given to us for free. We do not need to earn it. We do not need to pay for it. We can simply receive it. And all that we need to do is ask. And we will be connected to something bigger. Can I encourage you? If you have not accepted this gift, please do so. It really is free. There are no catches or hidden fees and you can be who you were always meant to be. One of God's precious children. You can be better. You can be more. You can be whole. If you would like to do this but don't know how, then please talk to anyone that you've seen up on the front today. Or talk to someone who brought you and we would love to chat with you. But please don't pass this offer up, because God is more than you will ever need. I'm not saying that it's going to be easy, but all those thoughts that are passing through your head right now of what you must give up, God is worth it. All those people that would look at you differently, God is worth it. All those things that you like to do which you know are wrong, God 
is worth it. He is worth it all. And he thought that you were worth it all. So he offers you the free gift to be with you in life and mould you into who you were always meant to be and then bring you into his presence <clears throat> at the end of life. You can be connected to something bigger. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you now as sinners, as people who know we have done wrong. In the quietness of our hearts, we would like to confess these things. We'd like to bring them before you. Ask for your forgiveness. Ask that you reconcile us to yourself. Ask that you continue to make us more like your son. Father, we pray that you would help those here today who haven't made that commitment. That you would work in them. That you would help them see that you are better. You are more than they need. And for those of us who have accepted you, we pray that you would help us remember that. You would help us know that day by day. And that we would come to you in worship, in spirit, and in truth. Bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.